always good to remind yourself from time to time of the nature of parallel realities, which, as you've heard me share before, is the concept or reality of there being realities, each being a snapshot in its own right, each being almost like a picture, a configuration of intelligent energy, crystallized. And motion or movement is not motion, movement, or change, and therefore the experience of time is not a mechanical, structural component of creation, of form, of the realm of experience. When it comes to the realm of experiences, which is what I typically just call creation, which is kind of the, uh, the out-breath of the creator, or you can visualize it as a heartbeat. Each creation is a heartbeat. It expands and then it comes back. Boom, 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 boom. But during the illusion of such a creation, we could examine the nature of phenomena, the nature of that creation, the mechanics of it. And one way of viewing or understanding the nature of creation is as a timeless or eternal vastness or field of potential with the potential of an infinite number of variations of an intelligent energy in form. So different configurations of this intelligent energy exist in potential and depending on the consciousness or the free will which desires to have a certain experience, desires to learn a certain lesson, it will tap into that potential and it will crystallize or make appear a snapshot of that potential. A configuration of this intelligent energy will then appear and then includes everything that we know in experience, meaning sensations and the senses and thoughts and images and so it's not just an image, of course, it is a, a multidimensional, multi-senses sort of image. But each moment is still, in this way of seeing it, understood to be a single frozen configuration or snapshot. So there's no actual movement, change, or motion inherent in the snapshot. The snapshot itself has no loose elements that can move around. Because the foundation of this snapshot, of this reality, is that eternal changeless basis. So motion is an illusion, change is an illusion, and therefore the experience or interpretation of it, which is time, is an illusion based on the appearances of this foundation or basis, this basic space. Because you can place one configuration, you can tap into this infinite potential and then channel that into intelligent energy and crystallize that into a configuration of energy that is slightly different than the one that you chose to activate before thus then creating the idea or sense that the objects in a single snapshot survive into the next snapshot, even though the next snapshot is a completely new image with new objects. So there is no independent existence to any of the aspects of any of the images that we perceive. And they don't last. Every nanosecond is a completely 100% new parallel reality configuration of infinite intelligence. It just appears because we're recreating it very similar to the ones before. It then appears that the same object continues to have its own existence throughout the different images. 
just like um, it looks like Tom Cruise by the end of the movie is still in the movie and that it's the same Tom Cruise from the beginning that existed, but it's actually a completely different image. So just to remind you of this principle and then to bring that to your current experience of your practical everyday life. But I just wanted to refresh your memory on the mechanics of it. So then, do we have any influence on what gets chosen or what is made to appear crystallized? If you believe in, I suppose, my view, the answer would be yes, because at the foundation of any manifestation is free will. Things don't just appear on their own volition. Things don't have a will of their own meaning a universe did not appear because the universe or that picture desired to exist. A particular shape, color, size, sensation, thought doesn't have a will of its own. A thought doesn't have a will. A sensation doesn't have a will. An image doesn't have a will. It doesn't have a desire. I think we can all agree on that, the couch as it appears, the sensation of the couch, the visual of the couch, the color of the couch, all that, that together makes up the experience of the couch. None of the components within this painting, within this dreamlike picture, has a will of its own. The appearance did not want to appear. So there's another force that created the appearance. And this is the concept of the creator in active form, or God, or free will which is all of you individuated. So you have, you are the power of choice, the power of free agency, the power of awareness, the power of consciousness, the power of learning, the power of knowing yourself. You are that formless, ingraspable, but undeniable presence that's hearing my voice and that can choose accordingly how it wishes to learn and know itself and what it wants to attract or create furthermore. So things only appear because of awareness. Out of this infinite intelligence and this potential, things only choose to crystallize and appear as an experience due to the force of the demand of the request of the desire inherent in consciousness or free agency. So it is the power of will, the power of intelligence in the form of free agency that then sort of presses its power onto this vast potential field. And then that pressure or that intelligence or that request will then generate the form that is desired, that is appropriate for the learning or for the desire that is wanted. And again, sounds technical and it is in a sense. But this is what you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You are demanding form. You are demanding more experience. You are calling forth. You are ever radiating the power of free will. You are ever pressing your force, your power upon the field of this potential. And therefore you are ever generating more experience. And so this is another way of explaining the law of attraction It's simply the pressure of the power to know yourself applied with desire to the field of potential and then automatically because of infinite intelligence innate in creation it will appear in the shape of the size the form that is most suitable to the desire that requested that experience so you're doing this right now because it's continuous and automatic and you've done it for millions of years in some of your cases, it is automatic. It's an automatic pilot. It happens automatically, continuously. There's no awareness of it happening, but you're doing it all the time. So billions of times per second, this intelligent energy is responding to your pressure, to your force, to your intelligence, to your request, to your desire. So law of attraction is really the law of radiance or pressure or request 
is what you radiate that you then generate. There is no real attraction in a sense. But it seems to come your way from your position. And then to boil it down to a more practical level, because it kind of leaves you with perhaps a sense of greater possibility, but then a question mark, so what do I do with that? And in general, I'd just recommend you stay close to your current trajectory, because this is the lesson you want to learn. But from this, there's a jumping off point at every moment is like an intersection. So you can just always picture, let's say three to five possibilities. And you can equate that to the fingers on your hand, your thumb in this case being the highest reality, then something slightly less exciting, but still very cool, then something neutral, or equal to your current experience. And then something slightly less exciting, and then something not preferable below that. So if you kind of use the analogy of your hand, the middle finger being your current, uh, a reality commensurate to your current vibration, the current state. And if your current vibration is like super exactly where you want to be, then that's great. You can just ride that wave. But typically we kind of, you know, dip, dip up and down to some degree and some moments are more boring than others. But if you see the middle finger as the vibration that represents your current frequency and just picture, imagine two more realities above it and two more realities below it. And realize that if your interpretation of your current reality, your, the current universe that you've demanded into form, if something about that doesn't sit well, but you're learning the lessons from it that you desire to learn from it, but you repeat or perpetuate that manifestation because of perhaps unconscious habit or reinterpreting what you see, which generates the same frequency which generates the same request, the same demand, which really shows you haven't extracted the learning yet. Otherwise, you wouldn't repeat that interpretation, really. So then imagine the realities, the potentials, and go from where you're at to something more exciting, to something truly, fully blissful and ecstatic, being represented, the last one represented by the thumb in this case the index finger being the one that's slightly more exciting, maybe quite a bit more exciting. And of course, you can imagine more if you want, but just to keep it simple, use that analogy of the hand. And so you can kind of dip down and attract less preferable things, or you can kind of bump yourself up, increase your expectation and increase how consciously you utilize this power of free agency. And um, just by having awareness of it, you will automatically shift your the power of your pressure, the pressure that your agency places, the force, the magic called working, the magical intelligence that it's placing on to the field of potential, you will then automatically increase your awareness of that and the output will be different. And therefore, what gets manifested will be different. So in these interesting times, it's always good to remind ourselves that there are parallel realities and that each of us is living in parallel reality next to one another with a consensus component to it, a line of communication that's very present here and mingled. But then there's other groups out there, you know, all kinds of subcollectives and cultures and religions and what have you, that each generate their own sort of parallel consensus reality. It's very different from our own even on the same planet. And then of course, there's the planet as a whole that's sort of choosing a somewhat consensus reality, but really it's made up of different components. The planet Earth experience is not one reality. It's made up of many different parallel realities. It's like um, a household for many different viruses. Many different viruses can coexist. Many different realities can coexist within a certain paradigm, as long as it sort of goes by the laws of gravity and this and that. But within that, we can paint that picture pretty much however we want. So the earth is our canvas, our collective canvas, and we each have our own sort of canvas within that overall canvas of earth's parameters or earth's paradigm. But within that, it can be very different. The experience of being an earthling can be very different for each individual, depending on 
their expectations, interpretations, and therefore the force that they apply or the pressure or the request or demand or the need that they apply onto the field of potential. So if you tune into yourself, and the body is to some degree a mechanism for knowing yourself, you can feel then also through the body what type of an energy or intelligence you are applying to this ever-present field that's always listening. So what are you sending out right now? What are you demanding right now? Through your expectations and your unconsciousness and your belief system. What are you radiating into infinite space, into this void of potential that is then being returned to you as this empty, illusory projection of experiences that have no basis other than the potential itself. But it seems physical, it seems real. So at some point, it really doesn't matter that much because you're no longer oriented, you're no longer focused in the physical when it comes to your sense of who you are. That loosens up more and more and more, you become more transcendent, if you will. But if within that reality, there is a stuck point and you feel like that's not in alignment with who you are and the most benign, beneficial, streamlined version of you, then it's definitely worth paying attention to what you're sending out right now. What are you radiating? You're always radiating something. Ultimately, you're always radiating from the heart of your, of your being, not your physical heart, but more like the crown. The soul is radiating. The blueprint for this life is really the only filter initially. The intention for this life is the only filter placed upon the light of your soul. So it's the light of your soul filtered or distorted through the blueprint, which is the basic intention for this life. But then as we grow up, we accumulate many, many more layers, many, many more filters that further distort our blueprint. So then the work, the calling work, for example, or the sort of empowerment slash to some degree self-realization work has us examine what those filters are. And if they are yes or no in alignment with the blueprint, at least, if not our soul. And at some point you can even examine your blueprint because that too is a filter that was chosen out of a need. But if you feel that need is fulfilled, you can renegotiate the blueprint. But you'd have to be clear and empty and present enough and willing to have learned the lessons that you came to learn to renegotiate a change in theme. But it can happen. Just like you can even transcend the soul. So there's really no limit to what you are. Like you can return to the one infinite creator. But within this game, you're looking at it from a point of view, a point of radiance, a point of free agency, a point of pressure, and that is constantly applying a gravitational type of intelligence or pressure or radiance and aura, if you will, into this field of potential, which you can liken to a void, to a space. But that space is filled with infinite potential. It holographically contains all possibilities of the creator, by the creator, for the creator. And so depending on what you're radiating, it will shape itself around you like the matrix shapes itself around the mind of one plugged into the matrix. And so you get what you put out. So what are you sending out right now? It's always good to go back to that foundation, that vibrational foundation and be aware of the filters. Is what you're sending out right now in alignment with your blueprint at the very least, if not with your soul, if not with God, if not with the absolute, is what you're sending out right now, at least in alignment with your intention for this life. Hierarchically, you can see it as personal filters, then the blueprint or the core sort of fourth density blueprint for this incarnation, then the fifth density higher mind, which sort of overviews as you go and send you signals. It has the overview, it's the mountaintop view. Then the higher self, or you could loosely call it the soul, which isn't really on, on your case, like the higher higher mind is on your case in fifth density. But it's more like this uh, depository of knowledge, this library of knowledge that just sends love and light and is available for guidance and help where needed. And then beyond that is the oversoul, which is essentially one with God. And then beyond that would be the absolute. So in simpler terms, person, blueprint, soul. Soul, in this analogy anyway, being a definition of what you really are. 
the light that you really are, the least distorted aspect of your individuality. And that just shines like a light. And then the first filter comes over, the first intention, the first need or desire is placed upon that frequency, which alters what you put out, which therefore determines the life experience and the incarnation that you attract or generate. And then within that incarnational life, especially third density, because you forget what you, why you came here, you accumulate many more layers and filters through which that light further gets dimmed and distorted until all you kind of know is I am insert name here and this is my life based on what I interpret my surroundings to be and what my mom and daddy told me and what people out there think. So then spirituality, whether in the self-empowerment branch or the self-realization branch, is about retracing some of those steps and getting awareness of that filtration process, clearing some of that stuff out and realigning ourselves to what we really are, matching our physical existence more and more to that metaphysical light that has no form but radiates nevertheless, that information, that energy. So how is what you're radiating right now, what you're expecting, what you're believing, what you're thinking, how is that in or out of alignment? with at the very least your sort of calling for this life, your core intention. And when I say that blueprint, I don't necessarily mean a plan that's all laid out like this. Uh, I'm going to do this for the first 10 years of my life, then this, then I'm going to make this switch. And it's not like that. When I say blueprint, I mean it much more rudimentary and instinctively as an intention, a core intention that filters the light of your soul into, into shape, into form, into a manifest subject, object, illusion, reality, where you get to learn certain things in certain ways and you get to know yourself in certain ways. And typically that intention has something to do, at least for the people here, with being of service to others. Combination of that and a certain thematic situation that you want to learn from, a certain theme of learning, a certain deficiency in your understanding that wants to be balanced out on a soul level. Your soul is incomplete. It is, uh, compared to our day-to-day -day experience, it feels very blissful, but it is on its own journey. The soul is not like God. It's not the completed being. It's not the seventh density beingness. It is on a journey. It has its imbalances, and so it generates desires. Its output is not completely unified yet. There's distortions, wobbles, which produce matter. Basically, the universe of matter is the result of wobbles and distortions. The less distortions and wobbles there are, the less physical existence needs to be. Because what is existence in form except symbolization of self? Form is symbolization of self. Form doesn't really exist. From the timeless original point of view, there is never any form. Form doesn't have any existence. It is an illusion. Anything that has form, shape, change, time, is an illusion, it's a mirror, it's a reflection, it's a, it's a production, it's a projection of light, of not even that, projection of awareness. And it appears to be there, but it has no foundation other than the self. So it's a self-appearance, it's an appearance of the self. It never leaves the self, it never becomes something other than the self. It just appears to be something other than the self, but that's the illusion you see. But so then what's its purpose? What's the purpose of form? It's to symbolize, it's to reflect. It's permission, to give permission to have a certain experience, to gain certain self-awareness. So if you see everything as symbolization of self, and perhaps more simply for the human mind to understand, symbolization of the soul. Let's say the soul wants to know itself. This is not entirely accurate because the soul is also a symbolization of the self. But to make it perhaps easier, for the mind to grok is like, let's say that the soul is the self, which again, it's not, you're not the soul, you're way beyond that. But if it was the self, then that soul will produce symbolization so that it can know itself. Because without form, then how would it know? How would it learn? How would it have an interactional experience with itself? How would it develop self-knowledge? You see, the entire universe is a symbolization of the self. What is the self? It's this formless 
ultimately it's the form of this absolute. But in order to even have the potential for the experience, which is caused by symbolizing oneself, there needs to be awareness. So awareness is the first manifestation of the absolute self. But ultimately, even awareness is a symbolization. But so then matter definitely is a symbolization. It's a crystallized symbolization of the self. And the more directly we are able to recognize the self without the need of form or sensation or thought or experience, the more we just know that we are directly from within intrinsic awareness, the more we recognize and rest in and abide in that intrinsic clarity that cannot be determined by any symbol. It's always there. It pervades all the appearances. It permeates, it continues. It's always there in sort of a timeless eternal state of just being aware of itself. If we recognize this intrinsic awareness intuitively, then we begin to loosen up the need for symbolization, for manifestation, for projection. It doesn't mean the world will entirely disappear right away, but it does mean that our relationship and dependence on learning through subject-object relationship begins to soften. And therefore, conflict and afflictive states begin to soften. And more peace and harmony and a feeling and understanding of oneness begins to radiate at the heart of our consciousness. We begin to radiate more of the truth. There's less need for filters. Because filters are just other symbolizations through which we can produce a universe and then know ourselves. So the filters are the echoes of the symbolizations that we've already created. And then those echoes produce further symbolizations or manifestation. But again, it doesn't really exist. Nothing has an actual independent reality. It is the self appearing to itself in symbolized form so that it can go, ah, look at that object. Well, that means I am this symbolization, subject, object relationship. I now get to know myself by looking in a mirror. I now get to know myself by experiencing pain and pleasure. I now get to know myself by having desires and trying to manifest them and then Ooh, being disappointed and then having success and then seeing other people respond to me and reflect me. And all this symbolization gives me this whole confusing, essentially, but kind of cool, uh, cesspool of information, symbolization. And then it's up to my free will to either wake up from that or to continue to perpetuate that. And so the more efficiently a soul is able to recognize itself, the less it will need this sort of maelstrom of turbulence and this ceaseless subject object manifestation. It doesn't mean not the things don't still appear. It just means you're not, you don't feel like they are necessarily real or tangible. You're not filtering your self awareness through them. You're not gauging it by them. You just know that you are intrinsically self luminous, self radiant, self existent. So then you can really begin to radiate and your energy centers begin to open and balance themselves. And you start to, the light of God starts to radiate through your unique, but also universal, diamond-like, crystal-like refraction of that universal light. But as you get more balanced and opened up and gain intrinsic awareness of yourself, there will be less and less reacting to symbolization and there will be much more wisdom and love that just radiates undistorted. And it starts to happen automatically. It's not like you have to always maintain it. The maintaining of the attention is what helps you generate that awareness. But really once the light starts shining, it, it, you just up level that and it just continues to shine even if you have forgetful moments. But the practice requires you to pay more attention to dig deeper, to go subtler. So the subtler you go in your awareness of yourself, the less overt or extreme your symbolizations need to be in order to know yourself. That's why the higher density entities produce less and less physical matter. But there's still symbolization, they're still having relationships, they're still having subject object connections, but it's less and less physical, more and more dreamlike, more and more metaphysical, more and more energy but still symbolization. So the more non-dual we go, the deeper to the truth that we go, the more all symbolization disappears. And in the absolute, there is an absence of all symbolization and yet full 
comprehension of oneself. The final mirror has been shattered. There's just itself. No symbolization left. That's why we say there's no universe in that state. Because there's no need for universe. Because the universe doesn't exist. It never has existed. It's always been a projection out of need. It's always been the reflection of what pressure you've placed into this field of potential. And if even for a moment you have no desire or need for any symbolization, because your recognition of self is so direct and so subtle and so intrinsic and so absolutely absolute, then there is no need applied to this infinite potential. And since there is no momentum to the universe, because there is no universe, the universe instantly disappears. It doesn't take time to disappear. You just stop recreating it. And this is the end of the octave. This is the end of seven density. This is the end of one universe of experience. You have fulfilled its intention and it reveals itself to never have been there in the first place. Not really, not as a real thing. So when you stop producing the need for universe, the universe stops appearing. But you never cease. You, know, you always remain. You just know yourself in completion and fullness in totality, in infinity. And that's why when for a moment you have such a pristine self-awareness that there is in that moment no need for symbolization of any kind, that is a realization of the absolute. And that's why for that moment you can have the experience of the end of creation. Even though a second later you can be back in the same creation because you reproduced the need for that symbolization. But the, once you realize this even once, once you have this experience even once, of the absence of all of creation. First of all, you can never see creation the same way again. It's fully undermined. It's like Neo having been awoken from the matrix. He can go back in, but he knows it's the matrix now. And there's never quite, you can never quite heal that gap. And that's a good thing. But it shows you then that the universe has no basis other than the absolute. It is just an appearance. And it doesn't seem that way from this point of view. But once you realize yourself free of any need for symbolization, you then have a glimpse of the absence of the universe. And because it happens instantly, the whole universe, your whole tens of thousands of lifetimes, whoop, instantly disappear. And there was no process involved in them dis dissolving. There was no like returning to the creator gradually kind of story. It just is revealed to be empty of existence, to be free of existing. And there's nothing but infinity, indescribable, beyond experiencing the reality on which everything is based and on which every illusion appears. That shows you that when you stop producing a need, you stop producing a response. The universe is nothing but a response to a need, to a perception, a distortion. And it's there for the creator to explore itself, to know itself, even though it's never going to be real. It's never going to be actually there. All that exists is itself. Symbolization is just a dream. Doesn't mean the experience isn't valuable, otherwise it wouldn't produce it. But what it perceives is not real. It lacks reality. What's reality? It needs to always be there. Otherwise, it can't be real. It needs to be solid, but it's not. It needs to be permanent. It needs to be independent from anything else, but it's not. But the absolute is independent from anything else you could ever conjure up. It just so happens to be you. So you are the absolute, and nothing exists independent from you but you exist independent from everything that's ever appeared. And the absolute is that, the absolute you. You are that which never appears. You are that which can never appear. And if you then examine your direct experience, you can go deeper and deeper, peel the layers of the onion back. Go like, well, this is still a perception. I'm still aware of this. And if I'm aware of this experience, it means this experience is appearing to some kind of a me, some I, some me. 
but often we think we have arrived at some place or we, we just kind of assume that we are the subject here of objects, but we're not realizing that where we position our subjectness, our feeling of being the witness of things, still has sensation to it, still has form to it, shape, quality, attributes. So we have to look at our very sense of self. And this is where self-inquiry comes in, according to Ramana Maharshi. Who am I? Who is it that's having the sensations? Who is it that's having the thoughts? Who is it that's doing the witnessing? And by doing that, you point to what you thought was you, and you place your awareness on what you assumed defined you. And then you begin to see that that's still a combination of sensations or states of mind and consciousness and form and attributes and qualities. Then as you look at these qualities, you begin to realize even further backwards, if you will, that you are aware of these qualities that you thought were you. It's still appearing. And if something appears, it cannot be the absolute you. Because you were there before it appeared, you will be there when it disappears. So you're not the thing you're looking at. Then an even deeper, more empty, more nothingness kind of sense of me arises like, oh, wow, that's liberating. I'm not my thoughts. And beyond that, whoa, that's liberating. I'm not even the witness of my thoughts. I'm kind of this space. And then you're like, wait a second, I'm aware of space. Still is quality. Space still appears. It's very subtle, but it still appears to me. And then you're like, whoa. I am the awareness that's aware of the space within which the witness and the subject and all that. So I am pure awareness. It's the most intangible quality because it's the first reflection of the absent. But most self-realization teachings end there because it's logical that uh, that which is aware of everything is awareness. But as soon as you give that a name, you solidify it and you make the self that which is aware, but it's actually not because awaring is still a quality. So it cannot be absolute. It's still an appearance. You are that which somehow knows, let's not call it awareness, somehow comprehends, somehow knows, somehow allows for, somehow enables the pure universal principle of awaring or consciousness. Consciousness is a quality. Awareness is a quality, otherwise we wouldn't call it awareness. The absolute is not a quality, or it wouldn't be absolute, that's why it's a good term. You can't call something that has a quality or that appears absolute, because it wouldn't be absolute. But if you call it awareness, if you think the awareness is the absolute, then you're saying that the quality of being aware doesn't appear, but it does to you. You are prior to God. God doesn't know you. You know God. God appears on top of you, on top of your faceless, timeless, indescribable identity. God appears, and then out of God, everything is produced to appear. But you're before the core of the universe. You're before the heart of everythingness. You're before the root of all that is. You're before the substratum. The substratum still appears to you. And then you, be, you realize somehow magically yourself as that, which can never appear. And it's impossible to describe what it's like to experience that which never appears as yourself. Because it's, you see, it's not an experience. Because in order to have an experience of something, it needs to appear to you. But you can never appear to you. You, you absolute can never appear to you. Because it never appears. It is, it's always you. Always you. Behind all the veils, it's always you. Before God, before time began, before eternity began, before timelessness began, a hundred trillion years before your first incarnation, you already were in a timeless, stateless, absolute, formless, non-appearing, conditionless state of infinity. That is you now, but you're looking at objects, so you don't see it. You don't sense it. Because you're looking at things and qualities. You're looking for things and qualities. You're looking to know yourself through symbols. And that's why the universe appears to you. And that's why we sometimes say, we meaning teachers or people who have realized it, that the universe is not real. It has never actually happened. 
and that to one who is fully established, the universe doesn't appear. It's because there is no need that produces the illusion. Awareness is a quality. God is a quality. It still appears. The subject, the subject, meaning the experience of witnessing your present set of objects, that seems pretty absolute initially. That seems like you. Okay, well, I am aware of objects. I get that. I'm aware of my hand. I'm aware of my body. I'm aware of my mind, my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions. That's sort of the initial stage of awakening. It's like, oh, I'm the subject. I'm not any of the objects. I thought it was my body. I thought it was my thoughts. I thought it was my emotions. But since I witness my thoughts and emotions and body, I'm realizing, I'm beginning to feel that I, whatever I is, is the witness of the body and the mind and the emotions. But I, as the witness, still has a feeling to it. It still has a shape. It still has a quality. And then with that quality of having a location, the witness has a sense of having a location. I'm aware of my body and my mind over here in Holland, inside of this room. So it comes with a sense of location. It's that same as the pure universal awareness. And the witness is the pure universal awareness, except you've dressed it up with several layers of being over here and being witness to this body. So the witness is nothing but pure awareness and localized form. The subject is nothing but that. So then you become aware of that. And then that begins to soften. You take off some jackets and you begin to intuitively sense that the heart inside of all your clothes, if you just like open your button a little bit, you can still have your clothes on of being human and your name and being over here and witnessing your life. But if you look into the heart of your experience of the witness, the essence of that is awareness itself. If you enter into the heart of awareness itself, and you ask yourself, does awareness itself have a location? Not what I perceive and therefore where I think I stand in relationship to what I perceive, but does the perceiving itself, not what it perceives and where it positions itself in relationship to what it perceives, does the perceiving itself have a location, a form, a space, a time, a body? And you'll see it has no body and it has no mind. It has no location and it has no form. And that's when the individual I am begins to intuit and dissolve into. It doesn't really dissolve, but it merges with, becomes reflective of the allness. It's the individual realizing that in essence, it's I amness is the same as God, God's isness. And then after uh, millions of years of uh, isness, <laughs> but you can skip that. I believe the isness or something in the isness, some awareness that the creator has of itself in that isness reflection begins to realize that the isness is still appearing. And if it's appearing, it must be appearing due to something else inside of something else to something prior to the appearance of isness in God. That's when the realization of the absolute begins of itself. That's when the black hole starts to form in the substratum of all that is, the metaphysical black hole. And that's when all the spiritual mass that has been gathered, all the, I am all that is, I am all that is, I am, I am, I am, I am. This, this God ego and that's about to explode. This is a balloon that goes bigger and bigger. Denser and denser, heavier and heavier with itself. Spiritual mass is gained and accumulated. Just like when a star gets too heavy, it implodes upon itself. It cannot go in any direction. It's so heavy, it just implodes on itself and it, it its gravitational pull becomes so strong that it absorbs all the light back into who knows what. It's the physical manifestation of seventh density going into the octave or the absolute, which is essentially an inner process. It's a metaphysical internal experience. The black hole, as we know, is just symbolization of it. That black hole is always wide open right now. It's always sucking you in if you want to. But of course, you got to be ready to let go of yourself as any particular thing. And that requires practice witnessing, being with the I am, investigating the qualities that you assume are you. But then you realize, oh, I'm aware of these qualities too. So I'm not even bound to these qualities. I'm aware of space and time. So I'm beyond space and time. Not just intellectually, although you can start there. 
But who is it that's aware of space and time? Is space and time aware of space and time? We feel like we are inside of space and time. But is space and time aware of you or are you aware of space and time? Therefore, you must. Just like the movie appears on the screen, the screen doesn't appear on the movie. Therefore, the screen is more permanent. It's more real than the movie. It exists prior to the movie. The movie comes and goes. Space and time are attributes or aspects of your generated perception, your symbolization. You are aware of space and time. Therefore, however large you think space and time are, they still don't exist any more than they ever have. And you are therefore free of space and time. Always have been timelessly free of space and time. Spacelessly free of space and time. Who observes the universe? Does the universe observe the universe? Or do you observe what you call the universe? Therefore, what you call the universe appears inside of you. You do not appear inside of the universe. Who knows God? Does God know God? Or do you know God? Who knows awareness? Does awareness know awareness? Or do you know awareness? The quality of awareness. The quality of being. Does beingness know you? Does beingness contain your existence? Or do you contain the appearance of beingness? And you have thought that your existence dependent upon being. Now there's a mindfuck existing without being. Who is aware of existing? That is before existing as we know it, before being as we know it. You exist free of even the experience of being or existing because you are aware of the quality of I exist. Because this illusion has been pulled over our consciousness for so many, so many hundreds and thousands of years within the illusion, of course, there is no years because that's a product, side product. It's in a subjective interpretation of the illusion. That's why it's not a real limitation. But you're used to it, so to speak. And so we generated a lot of sensations, a lot of senses of self based on the universes that we've produced. But in essence, it has no substance. It just simply means you are free of any assumption you could ever have of yourself. It doesn't even matter what you think you are ultimately from this vantage point. It doesn't even matter if you know yourself because any assertion of this is what I am would not be it. You are free from whatever you see. Just remember that. Call that spiritual bypassing all you want. It's still the truth. In truth, you have bypassed everything forever. You've never been part of anything that has ever appeared. So you don't have to take it on that seriously. You don't have to work your way through endless, infinite years of shadow work. Yes, it has its place in time in the relative world. But ultimately, your ultimate sense of self should not depend on anything you see, even the sense of self that appears when you say, I'm not anything that appears. Because when you say to yourself, oh, wait a second, what I am cannot appear. Instantly, there's a sense of that, a feeling. But then you apply it again and again and again. And that's where it gets trippy as fuck. That's when it starts to build momentum and gets truly psychedelic and transcendent. And that's where people freak out, and which is okay. But that's where your whole world is turned inside out, upside down, and just blown wide open, destroyed. The whole universe, existence, everything you ever thought was real. So, you, But you can go as deep as you want with that. Typically, sometimes you see a little too much. A little too much that is good for you. And then it's a little harder to get back and you have to integrate a little bit. But typically, you can kind of pace yourself and you can kind of shake it off and forget it. But if you go deep enough, yeah, you will hit a core and you will penetrate the substratum of beingness and you will realize that you're not even beingness um, that cannot be described but it will give you a glimpse of ultimate freedom the truth 
and you'll never be the same again. I guarantee you that. But there's many stages of peeling back the onion before that. It requires a lot of precision, a lot of dedication. This can be done in a single sitting if you do the proper technique and you understand the mechanism and you're able to apply that to your direct experience genuinely. It doesn't require years. It can be done in a single session. But that single session requires such profound dedication, will, concentration, precision, subtlety, finesse for a consecutive period of time. Not just uh, typically not just a couple minutes, but longer. Where you go beyond the layers, you peel back, you peel back, and your experience becomes more and more ungrounded and psychedelic. But you continue, you continue, you continue, you continue, you continue. And you realize you're God. And you continue, and you continue, you continue. Then you approach the very edge of the bubble of God, the substratum of the entire fucking universe. And you rest there, at the very heart of it, at the root of it, at the threshold. And you keep applying it. I'm beyond even this. Somehow, I'm beyond the purest subject I can get to. I'm beyond pure awareness, somehow. If you keep at it, keep at it, this weird, almost tunnel sensation, and in my sense, the body starts to compact itself. It's like, it's being crushed by gravity inward. It's a little hard to describe. Kind of like the contractions when you're free diving and holding your breath. But in a more metaphysical sense, although it feels quite tangible too. And then this tunnel can open up if you keep going and you keep your intuition awake. And you can begin to realize. And if you push it, which I don't necessarily recommend unless that's what you really want and you feel you're ready for it, you can have an exclusive realization, which means you are the absolute you're no longer a person reflecting upon it. You've shattered the mirror and you now are the absolute. And then there's an, there's an instantaneous perfection of all virtues, such as unconditional love. It's instantly perfected. There's nobody practicing it. There's no game you're playing anymore. There's no gradual nature to anything. All the realizations, all the perfections are instantly perfected, instantly. And there's no thought or process or ownership of it. There's no pride in it. There's no look how far I've come. It's in, you've instantly become the perfection of all perfections. And all these virtues are not even you. So, but they're kind of floating far away in the horizon as they apply to the appearance of the universe. But you've mastered the universe. You've perfected the perfections. And they are now infusing that universe through your whateverness. <laughs> So you've instantly perfected the perfections and you've transcended the perfections in a split second and nothing ever happened to you. So there's no pride, you see, because it's not like you have arrived then. It's not like, oh, yay, this feels so good. I've arrived. That's still when you're in the tunnels in, in, in between, when you still have the capacity of thought. You still have the capacity of r reflecting upon the absolute, but the absolute doesn't reflect upon itself from anything but it's just innate self-comprehension. There's no mirroring, you see. It is just itself, self-comprehensive. So there's no pride because there's no journey because you haven't arrived there. It wasn't due to your doing. It wasn't your accomplishment. That, that you disappeared with the entire universe. There's just you, the absolute. So you instantly perfect the perfections and it's no big deal. And you're beyond them at the same time. It's really quite cool. <laughs> and then you can choose to recreate the need for a universe, as I did. But you'll never be the same. This will always leave a gap in your universe. This will always leave a black hole in the sky. And somehow everything I just said is already the case. Already the case. Truth is always, always true. It's never clouded, you see. Only clouds are clouded. The truth is never clouded. The sun is never clouded. Only planet Earth is clouded. So the truth of the sun is all, always shining. 
It's never cloudy on the sun. The sun is never clouding itself. We're clouded from the sun. But that which is true is always true. It can never ever be clouded. <laughs>